Welcome, everyone. It's great to see you. My name is Rhonda Gilbraith, and um, I um, am happy to welcome you to this very special primetime presentation. The Friends of the Bethel Library um, collaborates with faculty development and various other offices on campus to celebrate the learning, the experiences, and creative endeavors of our Bethel community in and outside of the classroom. We are just thrilled to see so many of you here. Um, I'm going to give a quick plug for a couple upcoming presentations we have. First of all, um, next Tuesday, November 16th, same time, same place, Dr. Andy Bramson of the Political Science Department will share from his sabbatical research interviewing local pastors about the impact of political polarization on church life and spiritual formation. And then on Thursday, November 18th, Edgren scholars Dr. Ripley Smith and senior Kate Larson will present on their communication studies research project called No Place Like Home, Understanding Social Connection Amongst Those Experiencing Homelessness. So today, I am delighted to introduce our speaker, um, Professor Emeritus uh, Wayne Rusa, um, who will be sharing about the, the aesthetic philosophy um, developed for Bethel's campus by the founder of the Bethel Art Department, Eugene Johnson. This presentation is part of our community celebration of Bethel's 150 years. Um, Wayne came to Bethel in 1983, and he's taught art history here for 38 years. Wayne has a long list of publications and has served Bethel and the larger art community in many capacities, to name just a few. He was a longtime chair of the art department. He co-developed Bethel's NICAMS program, that is the New York Center for Arts and Media Studies. He's participated in, and for a time, coordinated the SIVA organization, which is Christians in the Visual Arts. He's curated and annotated a number of exhibitions, and he's mentored and inspired countless artists. Throughout his teaching career, he's also maintained his own creative practice, producing a large body of work. In fact, we in the library are thrilled to have acquired a few of his pieces recently. Um, and if you want to take a look at them, there's a couple right there on the wall and a couple at the top of the stairs. They're beautiful. His many contributions and achievements led to the great honor of his being named Bethel's second university professor in 2012. And especially relevant, perhaps, to his presentation today, he has served as an, as an aesthetic design consultant for several Bethel projects over the years, including uh, the Community Life Center and Brush Arbor Commons editions. Wayne is a born teacher with a great gift for explaining and illuminating challenging concepts. He's converted many an indifferent student to a genuine love of art, and he's mesmerized with his insight and commentary, many of those fortunate enough to accompany him to a museum or art gallery. He has many interests outside of art and scholarship. Not surprisingly, he loves to build things, he loves poetry, and he loves the wilderness. Wayne and his wife Cheryl have two daughters and a son and grandchildren. They make their home in New Brighton where Wayne has a remarkably well-ordered studio that's full of vibrant and various art, and Cheryl cultivates a beautiful garden. Please join me in welcoming Wayne. mostly true. Um, <laughs> the only thing she didn't say is like, in terms of my being all these committees, the successful parts of the building, that's where I, that, that was my advice. <laughs> and, the, and the failed parts, that, that someone else, you know, ignored me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so let's launch into this. There's, uh, this is nerdish, but I find it incredibly fascinating, and I hope you will too. Um, but maybe to help it uh, feel relevant to you, uh, 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 I want you to make yourself cognizant of the fact that this community lives and works in these spaces. We take them for granted because we're busy, we walk up and down the halls. Um, but the shape of a place shapes what happens in the place and how people feel. Um, so it, it is kind of your academic home, and for many of you, your employment home. Um, so it's, it's fun to talk about. Uh, you can see on the screen there my title, uh, by design, but short on money. That's every word in that title is important. Um, the aesthetic aspirations at every stage of development of this campus were high. The financial realities were sobering. And we always came out with something in between. Um, if your glass is half empty, uh, you're cranky and angry. If your glass is half full, you say, you know, you do what you can. Um, turn a salzier. 
sounds the same. <laughs> so, yeah, you make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. So, um, the other part of my title is Aesthetic Philosophy Guiding Bethel's Campus Planning. Uh, there was early on uh, literally an aesthetic, a set of aesthetic guidelines developed, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about here. Occasionally when I say that to someone, especially faculty that have taught with me for a long time, some of them go, really? Never heard of it. Um, but there was one, and it's been, um, it's been used ad hoc. Um, and, and that's part of why Deb Harless actually gave me a course credit to research and write this down and to create a pragmatic guideline for the Mark Posner's back there. Um, a tool, hopefully, that is actually useful for Mike and people that really do have to reconcile money and project and materials and time. Um, so my thanks to Deb, she's not here, but uh, for uh, actually paying me um, to do this. <clears throat> so um, let's launch in a little bit. Um, so um, most of you probably don't necessarily know this history, and I, I'm not going to do a lot of history here. Um, but uh, originally Bethel's campus was uh, downtown um, in Falcon Heights across from the state fairgrounds. Um, they were able to purchase this property because they were outgrowing that space. Uh, and then uh, between now and then and now, almost 60 years, um, a lot has developed. So um, I found this little photo in the archives and I loved it. I don't know who that guy is. Um, but just standing there in the wilderness with a sign. That's Glenn Hofer. Is it? <laughs> Shoot. Um, so, um, but the gap, a little black bar between these photographs, um, that's 60 years of development. Uh, we, we started off with, you know, barren space, uh, and we have now what we have now for, for good and for ill. Um, so, so how did that happen? Um, and uh, fortunately, there was a, a wisdom in the administration back then that realized we, we actually need not just a financial planner and an architect, but we need someone who's inside the community, understands the community, but has a keen aesthetic sensibility. Um, and they, they uh, uh, asked Eugene Johnson um, in 1963 to write a set of aesthetic guidelines that, that, that could kind of be the you know, constitution of design uh, for the institution. Uh, which Gene was, was happy to do. Um, and he, he really was the perfect guy to do it. Um, his BA was in philosophy, University of Southern California. His MA, first MA, was in theology, and he was actually uh, an ordained pastor. Uh, that was at Bethel Seminary. And then he got an MFA in painting. You all know him as a potter, a ceramicist, which is what he was, but his MFA was in painting. And as a person, he really was a deeply thoughtful and aware man. And you could, you could use all these labels for him. Um, philosopher, theologian, pastor, painter, potter, educator. Um, Gene was like a profoundly integrated personality. Uh, and uh, he, he really was the perfect guy, I think, to, uh, to do this project. Uh, he also founded Bethel's art department. But equally important to know is he, he worked with his hands. He built his own house over here in Arden Hills, um, a beautiful little uh, mid-modernist, uh, mid-century modernist house. He built his own ki uh, kilns. He built the mezzanine loft in the ceramic studio, which is still illegal. Um, <laughs> and he also built the art curriculum. So ideal guy. Um, so, so where did he start from? Um, Here's a couple aerials of the old campus uh, down across from the state fairgrounds. Um, and as you can see, oh yeah, Ann gave me this cool little pointer. Um, as you can, so here's, here's the heart of the campus. And it is in the center of a very developed neighborhood, an old neighborhood. Um, nowhere to go, Bethel was growing. Um, Bethel had started buying up houses in the neighborhood, a history house, a, a language house. Um, and so, you know, a student had to like walk three blocks over here to go to history class and over here to go to language. Uh, and they, they, they clearly saw this wasn't going to work. Um, and they began to look around for property and were able to purchase 216 or so acres up here in Arden Hills. Here's, here's uh, Lake Valentine. 
And you can see how undeveloped this property was. It, it's, a, its basic development was there were some dynamite shacks on it, uh, owned by the DuPont company, and then just dirt roads and wandering uh, and, and little vistas and so on. Um, so back to uh, our guy here, uh, standing there with this sign. Um, he, should, he should have a caption, right? I tried to put a bubble in there. You know, I wonder what this place will look like in 60 years. So let's put those side by side for a minute. The, the urban and the rural. This, this must have actually been an enormously creative project uh, to really go from that finished to that unfinished um, space. And before I launch into the specifics of what Gene laid out, I, I want to I layer in a, a larger idea, meaning question. Um, because I'm interested in this as, as more than just one local small college and what they did to solve their design issues. This actually belongs to a much larger conversation that's been going on since, uh, literally since Socrates taught in the center of old Athens. What, what is a campus? What, what, how do you shape a place where people come in community and learn? And does the shaping of the place matter to the learning? Does it express the learning? That's a really rich question. Um, so that's, that's, what's, uh, that's really what's on the board here. And Gene understood that. Uh, what should a college campus look like? Uh, it is an environment and an expression of community learning purpose. Who's our influence? Who's our prototype? Is there an American campus? Is there a Protestant campus? There are some, and they're not very nice. Um, <laughs> I'm being smart, Ali. But, um, but it goes, at the heart of the question is, well, you know, who, who is this community? Who is Bethel? Um, at that time, of course, it was a much stronger um, uh, Swedish immigrant um, influence in history and deep pietist roots. See, Chris Garrett's here, who could explain that, has written a book on it. You should dive into those. They're, they're really quite rich. Um, but let's parse the question out a little bit more. Let's put these uh, side by side um, and look at some of the qualities that are at issue. One, one campus is urban, uh, one is rural. That is a long standing, ongoing argument in American culture. Pay attention to the voting in any presidential election, the dip, whatever your stripe, rural, urban. Um, it's a huge question, um, and, and it, has, it goes deep in the DNA of, of being uh, an American. Uh, the urban is laid out on a geometric grid. It is rationalized nature. That has a long history back, especially to the French and to the ra rational garden, and the idea that we humans are creatures of primarily of reason, and it's our job to rationalize the wildness of nature. Um, versus the rural, uh, which is natural, minimally developed, open, flowing, organic, for heaven's sakes. Um, you know, shouldn't your education have all right angles? Or should it have a few organic curves thrown in? It, it becomes a really interesting linkage of design to meaning to sensibility. Um, so uh, in the grid, of course, nature is domesticated. Uh, in the uh, open campus that they just bought, uh, nature is minimally developed. And that question of development. Um, in the old one, the campus is, the community is related to the city. It's defining itself, it's your experience would be a city experience. And the new one, you're fundamentally related to nature um, and you're isolated from the city. So um, Gene and others had to dig into this question. What, what's Bethel's mission then? Who, who are we? Um, and uh, how, do, how does that relate to what we're going to do with this new space? Now, as long as you have a nerdy art historian up here, I'm going to batter you with examples. I'm just going to throw out three. Because um, I, want, I want you to get a feel for this thing that a campus is an idea. Um, well, let me pick two uh, for starters. On, on the left there, University of Virginia, originally uh, designed by Thomas Jefferson. And... Uh, See, I get my little pointer going here. So, so here is the central academic building. 
It's based on a European prototype, the Pantheon in, in Rome, which was a religious temple to all gods. Jefferson called it the temple of learning. All right? It's learning to all the liberal arts. Right? So, and, it, and it is Europe-based. That's its, it's its prototype. It's also at the east end of campus. So if you look this way, east, you're looking back to Europe. And this is a detentional premise Jefferson held. We came from Europe. Um, but it's time now that we're a country to stop sending our sons to Europe to be educated, because then they return as little Europeans. Um, and this is not a European context. So we got, we've got to educate them here on our own soil. Jefferson intentionally placed this in the rural countryside. He said cities are corruptive, they're distracting. Uh, young men won't learn properly. Um, and besides, the land is who we are. So he's favoring this, this kind of rural business. Uh, in front of the Temple of Learning are 10 little buildings. Each one is a discipline house. And these are in arms like this, looking west. Because this is us. We came from Europe. We go through the Temple of Learning. We master that. And we head out into the wilderness, the great continent. And as president, Jefferson commissioned surveyors to grid off the entire continent, to rationalize this whole continent, um, paying almost no attention to environment or actual organic features on the land. You just plunk a grid down, parcel it out, and go master it. That was, that was his mission for, for the university. Good and bad, very, very complicated. Um, just for fun, I threw in the opposite extreme over here. This is Deep Springs College in California. That's the college right there. Um, I guess they went with the rural uh, option. Um, they accept 12 students a, a, a year. There's no tuition. Um, and it's built on three pillars, uh, intense academics, self-governance, the students run the place, and manual labor. The reason there's no tuition is that this is a living ranch, and the students all learn the skills to run a ranch. Um, and they operate this whole thing with, with a small staff uh, while they get intense education. But you can't get accepted there unless you are willing to dedicate your life to service to the country. And they have an incredibly high percentage of CEOs, lawyers, judges, um, elected politicians, um, amongst their, their alumni. Um, isn't that fascinating? In this little rural place, uh, you know, this right here is a you know, college student uh, between doing homework and classes, wrangling cattle. Or really quick, a third, a little bit more immediate, our own neighborhood, uh, the United Theological Seminary, which was located in New Brighton, had a very modernist campus, gorgeous campus, because they started having dropped enrollment uh, and, and, and problems raising money, uh, they were forced to sell that property and rethink themselves. And they took the opposite track of Bethel. They moved into the city, um, into the Midway area, um, because they realized that actually is who we are. That's our mission. Why were we in the suburbs? Um, it has nothing to do with it. OK, so point being, where are you located and how do you design it? Is, is deeply linked to who you are and what, what you want to be. So um, let's draw back then to uh, this big change uh, that's, that's going to happen here. Uh, as I say, Gene was asked to develop then these guidelines. Um, and here they are. I'm not going to read them all to you, but, but, but they're short. This is it in, in its entirety. Uh, it's two and a half pages, uh, one and a half space, 12 font. I mean, that's just not enough, right? Um, but this was the genius of, of Gene. Let's, let's launch into those a little bit. <clears throat> oh, I should say, before we launch into them, um, that actually was, wasn't enough. Uh, because with every building and every project, of course, there was lots of conversation amongst the committee to make decisions. Um, and what I like to call Gene's original constitution, which is as minimal as our constitution, um, it had to be applied in new contexts. And 
that application, that interpretation, became part of the meaning and history and legacy of these guidelines. Um, and that's what Deb Harless asked me to write down. So here's how it appears now in this little manual we hope will be used. Um, and my thanks here to Jessica Henderson, our graphic designer, um, who, de who designed this uh, really beautifully. So the way it works now is, is you get, in bold, you get Jean's language. And then little footnotes down here in light uh, font, you get my history, interpretation, and analysis. So if you're really bored sometimes, you can read this and find out which buildings I think work and which ones I think flopped. Um, which is kind of entertaining. And, and I'm retired, so you can't get me in trouble. <laughs> so I, I like to think of this, then, as, as our, our design midrash, right? as the original text, and then a lot of rabbinical philosophizing <laughs> and, and application. Um, let's move into it a little bit. Um, I want to say a couple of things about Gene's like mindset as he put this together, because it's really crucial. He he was so brilliant. He 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 literally um, is giving us here a way of thinking. You know, a way of thinking. Um, it's not a prescription for style, and that's really crucial. You can imagine an aesthetic guidelines being, you know, always use balanced windows and green carpet. You know, it's, it's not that. Um, it's a way of thinking. So, and also, just this is Gene, he called them suggestions. Um, true pietist spirit <laughs> to the end. Suggestions. It's ironic, people. Um, and, and he meant that, and, and oh, so he, was, he was great. Um, so his suggestions, call what they're not. They're not a list of aesthetic rules. That doesn't work. You can't create a, a list of aesthetic rules that always uh, hold up. They're not a description of style or of taste. Now, that's, that's a dicey conversation. But Gene was quite aware of taste is one thing. Um, uh, aesthetic quality is, is something else. Uh, his suggestions are a way of thinking about the character of aesthetics and of the campus. His key principle through all these guidelines is character. What is the character of the community? What is the character of sand molded brick versus crisp edge baked bricks? These bricks create one kind of shadow down the wall that's gentle and subtle and nuanced. These create a harsh edged shadow down the wall that's not nuanced. We're a nuanced community. We're about persons. We don't want a crisp, hard, geometric brick. We want a soft, I mean, did it, he just had this way of understanding the linkage of character. Um, so they're about character, and character is about a total integrity, a synthesis of purpose, function, materials, space, scale, sight, texture, light, shadow, and detail of execution in relation to the human, human community and how it lives in space. Um, he divides his, his suggestions into three parts. The character of the site, that's this whole you know, almost virgin territory that we were moving into. The character of the campus as a whole, he's very interested in a holistic approach. And the character of the architecture. But as you read these woven through, he's always talking about our character and our understanding of God's character. Um, Stuart Luckman, uh, our, our previous sculpture prof, used to always say, um, uh, Gene had a theology of materials. Uh, it's a great, great concept. Um, and all of this he understands in terms of human experience in relation to nature, society, God, and each other. Uh, for Gene, aesthetics is not a formalist thing in itself. It is rather the, the embodiment of relationships between and expressive materials. So therefore, the character of these elements must be understood in order to find a meaningful embodiment as design. All right, I hope that's not too esoteric. Um, but based on that, he, he makes these aesthetic recommendations. Um, and his argument is that without understanding the character, experience, and purpose of the function, we're always going to be vulnerable to style, fads, regionalism, and trends. Pretty hard to escape those. But 
Uh, all right, I'm not going to take you through all three pages, but I'm going to, I put up the first couple paragraphs here, um, and I highlighted them um, uh, in the way that, that I've been interpreting them. So let's look a little bit at that. So this is from Gene. The character of the site and a little bit from the character of the campus as a whole. Character of the site. The new site consists of approximately 160 acres of small rolling hills surrounding Lake Valentine with three or four rather heavily wooded areas. The present entrance road, which winds about gentle wooded hills, gives one the feeling of pleasant relief from the tensions of urban life and a refreshing realization of the beauty to be found in God's natural world. As one moves about, he is repeatedly confronted with delightful changes and pleasant vistas. It might be quite appropriate to try, as far as practical, to maintain this theme for our campus, to preserve and cultivate a quality of naturalness, together with the elements of variety and surprise. I'm not suggesting here the bizarre, but rather the delightful that occurs in nature when you unexpectedly come upon the unique and the beautiful. Um, and then he theologizes a bit. In character with the site, the campus should reflect a quality of naturalness. The buildings should seem to belong, as though they are a proper part of their setting. This is not to suggest a naturalistic orientation of theology, but rather a recognition of the creative work of God in nature, and that the Christian witness is not a contrived facade, artificial or pretense, but an elemental commitment that is genuine and compatible with all that God has done. And that's the way his mind weaves things together. I mean, the things I highlight in yellow are the qualities related to the character of. What I highlighted in blue is experience, that we, we experience things as bodies in space and time. Um, and what's the, what's the nature of that? Uh, and highlighting the green, that's his way of thinking. And in the red, um, that's his theological substrate, which is always there. And I want to emphasize this because I think it's deep to Bethel. Um, and the worst of me fears that as the economic pressures that are coming upon us get too strong, we might abandon this. Um, Gene was very much that the genuine Christian character is worn in the interior. It's not branded. It's not outward symbols. It's not spectacle. It's not political. It's deep in the interior. And a community of people that are deep in their interior spiritually together will manifest these richer, nuanced ways of being and make it a place where you thrive. Um, you'll notice, we may not get to it because of time, late in his suggestions, he actually says we should have almost no symbols, no, almost no overt Christian symbols. Um, because we're an in, that's inward. Um, so hopefully you're getting a feel for how this, this man thought. Uh, let's look a little bit of it um, in application. I'm looking at the clock back there because I'm terrible about obeying time rules. A um, couple of plans here. So, so one of the first firms that Gene and company um, contracted was Sasaki Walker. Sasaki was a Boston landscape architectural firm. And this is one of their initial site plans. Um, and they started with the whole. Um, what's the nature of this land? Where, where are the contours? Where are the trees? Where's the water? Um, and begin to ask, how would you then nestle buildings that belong into it? We don't want buildings that dominate, um, aesthetically ugly, spiritually an atrocity. Um, that's arrogant. Uh, we want things that belong, that, that tuck in. Uh, and so. Uh, they started with the, this larger site plan, and their first decision, this is my coloring over here, so don't, uh, you won't find this in the archives, was to, to realize the zones in this site. Uh, the outermost zone is traffic. Uh, roads, highways, streets coming to it, automobiles arriving, the machine. Okay, that's, that's a zone within a community. Um, and their intent was to keep the zones as much as possible on the perimeter. Um, don't let them penetrate too much into the center uh, in a sort of ad hoc fashion. So, so uh, the red is our roads, you know, surrounding and our highways, and then uh, our entrance lane coming in. Um, the second zone, like in this green here, um, was was trees. 
Um, and they very literally said, it's crucial if you have traffic and machines coming around, you need a perimeter of trees to screen that, to begin to um, scale this down to persons. Um, obviously, at some point, the machines have to penetrate the tree ring. So there's two entrances. As that happens, though, as those entrances flow in, they need to be tree lined. Parking needs to be outlined so that people leave their machines and take their personhood through nature into the <coughs> buildings. And so you are to have trees, parking lot, more trees. Um, I've been here long enough that I've seen trees come and go. Problem with trees, they die, but you can replant. Um, and so you leave your car, you walk through another ring of trees, and then you, then you walk into the buildings that are nestled into the contours of the hills seeming to belong. Um, and Gene's idea is you belong there. Um, you've made this transition from that outer world that's gridded off to this inner world that's more uh, or organic. So that, uh, that got developed. And one of the fun things, if you are a nerd, um, is to go through the archives. You'll see lots of different early concepts of how many buildings and where they're laid out. Um, and you can, you can play with those. Um, I'm not going to comment because time is time. Um, now, given what I just said about the trees, I don't know if you guys have thought about that or felt that. Um, as I was looking back through the archival photos, though, um, I discovered that, in fact, the original campus was not that heavily wooded. There were, there were patches of trees. Um, and here's a couple of old photographs where you can see you know, really how open and barren a lot of it was. And you can barely see in here lots of little saplings. And in fact, they were very systematically planted in relationship to pathways and vistas. Because Gene was big on this idea that you should come upon surprises, refreshing little moments. Um, and if you walk the campus today, these trees are mature. Um, and, and to a pretty reasonable degree, it, it works. Um, there is, by the way, a well-developed from Performa, a manual on planting on campus, which is sort of the planting counterpart of what I've done for design. Um, and uh, kudos to our grounds crew for quite a while. Um, they, they, they've really attended in many ways, and there's, there's lots of quite lovely uh, moments. Um, now that we're fully developed, the question for that, that group is, um, how do we keep this natural enough? Because we're now approaching such finish that we might be shifting paradigms without knowing it, and, and which could be OK, but do we want to do that? It should be a deliberate design decision. All right, so anyway, so trees, you drive in, you park, you walk, more trees. Um, and then the plantings start to scale down. So you know, on the other side of this, road here, or trees uh, on this side, you know, are, are, are lower plants. I was walking in this morning, looking right over here at the wall along the CLC, and they have a really lovely three-colored, three-tiered row of plantings. Um, it's quite stunning, actually. And, and it also mediates the grass hitting that gigantic brick wall that's, that's a bit overscaled. Um, so there's, so there's you know, nuance, right? It's just uh, it's about nuance. And, uh, and then when, so once you get into the interior of the complex, it's to become more and more intimate um, and, and personal. And I love this idea Gene had in that one little phrase, the buildings should seem to belong. Um, and in many ways, they do. Um, now, I know this is a little controversial, but it's my last shot. So um, I'm going to champion the seminary buildings. Um, they, they have problems, the biggest of which is they're built in materials from the 1960s, and, they, and that sucks because they're, they're I don't know, it's, it's really a problem, a very practical problem. Um, but in terms of, of, of design, um, it's quite a stunning um, space. And above all, those buildings seem to belong. And yet, they distinguish themselves. Okay. And, and, and the integration is fantastic. Another of Gene's phrases in his guidelines is, 
There should be no monolithic buildings. Um, there should be uh, uh, groupings of smaller buildings that breaks it up. Um, and, and the seminary, of course, of course does that. Um, whether you're approaching here or coming up from the lakeside. Here's another little passage from Gene's uh, suggestions. Uh, Bethel is a Christian community, and we are anxious that our buildings reflect this commitment. We realize that essentially this is impossible in buildings alone. A Christian is a person. But surely our architecture should be of such a character that it is compatible with the characteristics of a witnessing Christian. So if I said to you, uh, make a list, like, what are the characteristics of a believer, what are the characteristics of architecture, now match them. It might seem an odd assignment, uh, but Gene had no trouble with that. Both people and buildings should be warm, friendly, receptive, open in spirit, should be personal rather than institutional or ecclesiastical. Um, his move from breaking down the grid on Snelling Ave was to then break down institutional. To, to keep it personal, which links with organic uh, in nature. Um, and above all, it should be genuine. Avoid pretense, imitation, fadism. It should be modest in manners, careful in stewardship, maturity, seriousness, and purposeful, hoping, inspiring, uplifting. A lot, of, a, lot, a lot of companies would say, those are like almost worthless aesthetic guidelines. Um, I mean, what does that mean in terms of the color of the carpet? You know, Help me out here. Um, but, but that's why I know in the wisdom of Bethel's administration, they will always have uh, an art faculty member on every committee, and they will listen to them. <laughs> that's my last shot, you guys. Uh, he goes on, on the, on the use of symbols. This is really crucial. And uh, you know, I've been on enough committees where architects came in from the outside. They studied us, and, and they, they said, this is a Christian community. I mean, I, I can't even see. There's no crosses around here. What, what's going on? Um, my favorite one was when Sasaki said, how come you, we've kind of gotten rid of this now, but how come you have all these coat hooks on the walls outside the classrooms? And we said, well, they hang coats. And they said, yeah, but don't those get stolen? He said, well, we don't have crosses, but we have coat hooks. Internal. Um, so use of Christian symbols, although not a necessary part of our tradition, may be helpful at some points. They should be used sparingly and with meaning. A building itself, like the chapel, may well serve as a significant symbol for the entire campus. Um, that, I'm going to skip a little just to get uh, at myself a little bit. So, um, One of the other features Jane was big on, um, in the sense of the wholeness, was um, what's called indoor-outdoor integration. Um, that as you move from highway, trees, road, trees, parking lot, trees, sidewalks, building, um, once you go in that building, ideally you should not be totally closed out. The seminary exemplifies that uh, in obvious ways. And I, I am, you know, I'm being partly smart aleck like here of, of championing this. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not real pragmatic um, for larger buildings with larger groups, but we've, we've started to figure that out with some of our additions. So uh, I'm going to go fast here just to show you a few of these. They're so beautiful. But we, we have started to open up space. That's kind of a dark photo. You wouldn't know it. Um, on, the, on, the, on the college part of the campus. But let me get to my next kind of big points. I've just got maybe eight minutes or 11 minutes. So let's go back here to an early aerial. Now, now we're not in the seminary. We're at the original college buildings. Four giant neo-penal cubes of brick. Um, although mediated by sand-molded brick, which does soften them. Um, but they're harsh. Do, I mean, I know that's a black and white, but do these buildings seem to belong? Are they kind of like outer space, like cargo cults just plop down? Um, they're, they're, they're harsh. Right? They're harsh. Um, but, but let's be fair. I, I've, I've put in here a couple of slides from the minutes. Uh, and the, and the, the Gene wrote out a history of all of this uh, in a kind of column form. 1969, construction of the Seminary Chaplain Student Center. Gorgeous building. They had money. 
they pulled it off. Um, but uh, let's read the fine print. Um, they want to move on to the college now. Bids received were too high, resulting in stalemates and frustration. 1970, faculty got their back up. Faculty retreated in September, voted to ask the board and administration to make every effort to find means to enable the college to move to Arden Hills by 1972. The, fa the seminary is teaching up here. It's beautiful. You know, seminary is meditating, wandering. Um, <laughs> college students, you know, sweaty little grid. Um, and, the, and the faculty said, we've had enough. We want to go to the new campus, too. And I was a faculty member, and I'm totally with you guys. This is what we do. You know, we say it's, it, we're, we're idealists, and we push our way, and the minister says, yeah, no, they're right. They're right. They should have their way. Um, we'll, we'll do the best we can. So, so how did that happen? Well, they fired the architects of the seminary. Art Hague makes a joint proposal with LRB Architects, we've got a new architect, to build a college complex for a mere $6.2 million based on a feasibility study done in April, ground broken at general conference in June fast track system of construction began. That's what we could afford. Well, we got on campus, which is a good thing. But we're teaching this gorgeous, learning, spiritual, holistic thing in these neo-penal brick cubes, um, where you don't even know what's building you're in when you go in and out of a stairway. You know, you know they're all the same. You got anyway. Um, and we have spent 60 years overcoming that, um, as we needed to do things. And, and, and in some pretty interesting ways, we've, we, we have overcome it. Best way to overcome that is just build buildings around it until you can't see the original, the original <laughs> block, um, and then open up the hallways inside a little bit, um, and, and you'll do okay. So we, we put that glass box on the, the back of... Uh, LRC building. Um, on, the, on the CC building, we put this glass wedge as we added staircases there. And it helps um, if you're inside and outside. Um, it helps. I almost never remember to go up and down these stairs, but they're really quite, quite refreshing. Um, we wrapped a whole CLC building around the academic center on one side. That really helped get rid of that thing. Um, and on the back side of the, the, the Kresge Courtyard area, well, we wrapped it again. Um, and now using a lot more glass um, and openness. Um, and in fact, pleasant vistas pop up left and right. Little refreshing surprises. And especially in winter, I mean, who designs a brick box in Minnesota? Um, except for the glass skyways. You watch students congregate there like, like, like flies to a light. Um, in the winter, um, just to get some, some, some sunlight. And then, then we wrap the you know, wellness center um, and so on. So, so we've done okay. Uh, only took 60 years, but um, uh, with some successes and failures. And in, in my thing, I get cranky in some details. Um, you, you can read that if you really have nothing else to do. Um, I, I want to draw back just for a minute to this business of symbols. Um, because I, I understand the power of branding in American culture. And when your business side is challenged, um, we turn to branding. And that's, that's not a bad or a good. It's just, it's just a pragmatic move. Um, but to understand there's branding and then there's branding. What, what branding would, would be integral with all of this versus what branding would be faddish or spectacle or showy and falsify you know, the best of who, who we want to be. That, that's a really important design question. Um, so is there deeper branding? And, and this is what I'm interested in, this deeper nuanced branding. Um, in fact, there's influences from overtly religious architecture all over this place. Um, one of them is the CLC itself, and I'm comparing it there to a Normandy, a Norman cathedral. Uh, Norris Strawberry is the uh, a Sasaki architect who designed the CLC. Um, figured this out that, that we don't want overt things, but he wanted to he wanted to suggest this deeper character. He actually looked to older architecture um, as a very subtle prototype. 
there's a there's a, the ruin of a Norman um, um, uh, rural cathedral, um, and there's our, our CLC. And he, he loved this uh, bell tower on the seminary. That's such a wonderful understated memory that just says a whole history of, of spiritual architecture, as well as the walkways under, which are very cloister-like. Okay, and the original uh, d designer um, just really nailed that um, in a in a in a stripped-down modernist way um, that's so elegant. And so Norris sought for ways to do that, and so he got interested in the idea of these tower-like facades that had att attached round bell towers, uh, and he gave us a sort of negative implied bell tower on, on the front, which on one hand is a welcoming scoop, you know, it's, it's, it's come on in. Um, on the other hand, it's like a subliminal memory, um, especially next to that facade with its two, its, its two towers. Um, and that was going swimmingly until Norris added this little limestone element here, um, which, which I like. I, I think it works. Um, my dear friend Stuart Luckman went ballistic. Um, it's got a little Greek cross in it. And Stuart, in his inimical way, named it the Greek sugar scoop. The Greek cross looks like a sugar scoop. Um, it was an ineffective nickname because it went up anyway. Um, and salute to Stuart's memory. I just attended his funeral uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, and then there's other moments. Like I said, I'm retired, so. Um, I was walking around campus taking pictures for this talk. There were a, a, a lot of visiting parents doing tours. And, and one dad who was clearly bored out of his mind said, why are you taking pictures? And I said, I told him what I was doing. He said, oh man, you got to get a picture of this. There's a cross over here. It's fantastic. I don't like that cross. I, I think it's not Gene's spirit. Sorry. Um, I outvoted by far. Um, but this man was so proud of it. I thought, okay, Wayne, you know. Maybe you're on an aesthetic high horse here. Yeah, it's not hurting anybody. You've got to be in the building and look up. It's not too overt. Um, I, I poke at this simply because if we're trying to grapple with the, the nuances of design, um, it's really useful to be able to honestly sit down with different eyeballs and say, what happens when you look at that? Does that work? Does it not work? Do we want more of that? Is that one enough? Um, so it's, it's really my argument for discussion, open discussion. And, um, I love the sugar scoop. Stuart never forgave me for that one. Um, I don't love this one. Maybe you'll never forgive me for that. But anyway, but if you want Gene's sense of where a cross should be, right, right here, this is the chapel, seminary chapel building. And there's a brick cross in relief right there, which you can't see today because erosion has caused us to put metal scabbarding over it. To, I think that's why that metal's up there, uh, to prevent further um, erosion. But it's too bad because it's a really beautiful moment, and it's right around the side from that, that bell tower. Okay, um, I'm coming to the end of my time, so there's our guidance. I'm sure I've got other great slides in here, but um, I'll leave you with that, and eventually You'll be able to get this through Amazon. No. <laughs> You'll be able to get this through Kenton Library. <laughs> um, if, if you want to scrutinize it, but uh, you've, you've probably heard plenty. You've got other stuff to do. Um, we've got a couple of minutes for questions, if there are, are some. Wayne, when is that available, that document? Do you know, Jesse? But whenever I say it's available, I know I know these are drafts. They're not the officially published. It's like when they book companies send faculty free books and they say not for sale, real big. It's kind of in that category. Um, but I could give Mike one, right? I mean, he's safe. Yeah. <laughs> I can get Mark one too. I think I have three of them up here. That's all. Wait, I've, I've often wondered about the seminary chapel and. 
I appreciate what you've had to say about the, the entirety of that building, but when you're sitting in the seminary chapel, to me, it's a depressing space. Yeah. And is, was that, I mean, is there something missing? Or, I mean, what went into the thinking of having this box that has no windows? It feels kind of suffocating and to me, yeah. but. Yeah. Um, short answer is I don't, I don't know. I, I could not find any minutes, notes, et cetera, that discuss that decision. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I kind of have a similar feeling. It's you, you come through all this, you know, through nature, and, and then all those halls with indoor outdoor integration, and you're going. It's my my sense is that the idea is it's sort of the holy of holies. You've then gone into the the inner sanctum, um, and instead of perforate those walls with windows, um, you're you're in that inner sanctum. Yeah, it, but I, I also, it feels heavy, psychologically heavy to me. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Ever since the sort of western end has been filled in with buildings, whenever I drive into campus from that perspective, it feels like a hill fortress that does not want to invite the outside world in. And I don't know whether that's just me or if I'm Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Are you referring to the gateways or the CLC or both? The, the CLC and the surrounding buildings. Yeah. Feel in that we don't want external influence or ideas. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, well, those are interesting words to put to it. Um, Could you repeat that, Wayne? Yeah, she was saying when you drive into campus on the west side now, um, in some ways it feels very imposing, almost like stay out of here. Um, I'm translating your words, I don't know if I'm being fair to you, but it feels kind of imposing, did you say? Well, it, does, it doesn't feel, to me, welcoming, and therefore maybe that we don't want outsiders. Yeah, it doesn't feel welcoming, and maybe it's saying we don't want outsiders. Um, yeah, that's an interesting, when, so when the CLC building was designed, there was a competition of three finalist architects, all, all of whom built models. Um, this is Sasaki, the one. Hamelin Green built the other. If you're familiar by any chance with North uh, um, Luther Seminary, um, Hamelin Green built their student, their counterpart, um, and it's a very low-profile, tucked-in uh, kind of building. Um, and then there was a St. Olaf firm, uh, Solvig, that um, thought we had not paid enough attention to our soils, and they actually proposed. Um, that we build this right in the center of campus, and the main entrance would become the other road, um, which which just was so out of the prospectus they'd been given um, that the then president George Brushover said, and that's no, they're out, it's down to these two. Um, but the debate was interesting because, um, like David Brandt, who was provost then, he he preferred the Hamel Green. He said it's it's it feels more humble. Um, and others preferred the Sasaki. Um, in the end, the argument that kind of carried the day was, um, and this kind of came from Norris Strawbridge, was um, you, you need something that says a little bit more formal and collegiate. Um, even our signage at that time was kind of routed out with signage, and, and everything that was pretty informal. Um, and their argument was, um, especially as we're talking about, um, um, yeah, having more cloud academically. Um, you, you need something that's, that says collegiate more. Whether, right or wrong, that, that's kind of what carried the day. And so originally it was set f uh, about 30 degrees more, so it faced directly to the lake. Um, and that was really imposing. They, they turned it about 30 degrees. Uh, creating kind of a wedge shape between the, the AC and that, which got filled in with some science stuff. Um, and that 45 degree angle you saw it on softened it and helped it. Um, but, but you are right. It, that, it's interesting that formality you know, strikes you as a little foreboding. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's the story. change one thing about the way we've developed the 
but oh, um, <laughs> wow. You keep you're saying you're retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, but um, but it's a serious question. I, no, it's not snarky. Um, well, if we're talking the big picture, what I would have changed is the initial four boxes. Um, I mean, I think in many ways the wraps we've done uh, are, are pretty successful. But when you think about it, those are all driven by four boxes. It's like you make a mistake early in your life, and that sucker haunts you um, all the way, you know, one way or another, Maybe either through its presence or its absence. So the, the presence of those four boxes has driven a lot. Um, now I feel that particularly in the interior issues. Because we have softened the exteriors. Um, but the interior issues, I, what was I talking about before about, oh, now we're painting some old halls white. Shouldn't we do that? Um, the burnish block was a brilliant economic decision. It was about the best of study service you could get at that price, which also meant low maintenance, which is another major cost issue. Um, we lived with a long time, and it, it's dark. Um, so we're now mediating it. Um, we're, in some of our departments, we're doing nice entrances. Like Business Econ now, they have a, a they have a, you know the integration of indoor outdoor. Here's the hallway you can see in. Um, big mistake on that though was putting that stone veneer. The stone has nothing to do with the canvas. That little stone, it just looks applied. Um, it should use sand molded bricks and, and connected. Um, I understand our need for something that's felt more formal and dignified. But th that would be interesting to hear Gene weigh in on that. Um, what's the nature of the material? Um, this is formal but warm. This is formal but cooler. You know, but anyway, it's, it's not the end of the world, that's, that's all, but I, I would have preferred to see something else. But I love the integration they gave. When you're walking down the hall, it says, here's Business Econ, you're welcome in here. Or aren't you at least curious? what goes on, um, that's, that kind of thing softens these hallways um, a lot. And we're doing that in some places. From the maintenance point of view, some of them are probably easier to maintain than the sheetrock ones. They get bashed and repainted and all that. But that's where a dialogue with you know Mike and Mark and the artists could go a long ways too. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to know your favorite space Um, I, I, my very favorite space, and I, I can't believe I'm even going to tell you this. Um, this is completely because of my weird artwork. Um, is actually when you go down the stairwell in the back of the gem building, there's a place where they left a cement abutment showing about this much. And every time I go down there, I look at that and think, I think there's a secret building behind that. Okay. <laughs> that's my favorite space. That's the most fun space, but that's dumb. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I really do like on the third level when you're walking through the CC building and you go um, through Brush Armor Commons and on that, the, the, the bridge and the opening up of the space, the way the light comes in, um, those kinds of spaces, and they exemplify Gene's thing. The, the materials, there's integrity in the materials, although, Mike, if we could give us some of that red tile. It's still in the stairways. Love to as well. That 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 would complete that one off. But yeah. th there's a nice integration of materials. They're simply stated, um, but they're interesting. The details of the metalwork there is is interesting. Um, and then the vistas you get um, are, are are nice. Um, so I think that that's sort of one of my favorites, um, as well as on this in the seminary. Um, yeah. All right, I think we're at the end of our time anyway, so thank you for coming.